Welcome back to the Strength and Speed Podcast. I'm your host, Strength and Speed owner and Mudgear Battle Alliance Pro, Evan Preparis. Joining me, I have another one of the Mudgear Battle Alliance Pro uh, athletes with me. So I have Jay Flores. Jay, welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, you know, uh, Jay's also, let's see, yeah, I mean, you got a handful of Savage podiums where you're at over 50 podiums total and mm-hmm. conquer the gauntlet podium stuff like that and then uh also the master of the rig uh world champion there from back in was that 2017 2017 yeah we need that back man <laughs> yeah we, like it we can talk about that <laughs> in a little bit because i know uh, i know people people who may not have been involved in the sport for a while probably have no idea what we're talking about when i say master of the rig there yeah so uh before we jump into today's episode though let's do a quick word from this episode sponsor so this episode is brought to you by Force 5. If you're at OCR World Championships, if you're at Battle of the Lines this year, or, you know, a lot of Savage races, you know, Force 5 is the grip company that is essentially on almost every brand's rig at this point. So, you know, you want to train with what you're going to experience on the course, so you're used to grabbing those specific holds. So you're definitely going to want to pick up some Force 5 holds. I know I just, re- I just put up my rig in my new house finally after uh, not using it for a couple of months. And I uh, just put up some force five, uh, some of those short ropes hanging off there. So I definitely need to get some more. So my rig is a little more OCR race specific, but yeah. What are your opinions on force five? I know you've been using them for a while. Yeah. So force five was actually one of my first sponsors. Um, and it, it's kind of a cool story of how it happened. Uh, it was a terrain race that um, Carl had flown down to. Carl is one of the um, founders and owners of, uh, force five and they live in montreal so for him to be in south florida at a terrain race was um because they were doing some as evan was mentioning putting obstacles on a lot of their or sorry putting r- grips on a lot of their obstacles and i was in second some guy from italy had come <laughs> down and it was really good i think it was one of the best uh, italian guys he, he separated from me early on and I had separated from third and it came into the last obstacle, which has like, it had like a balance beam, then to a cargo net and then down this pole. And I was just out of it. And I ran right past the balance beam and the structure had kind of like these steps. So I kind of just walked up the edge of it um, onto the cargo net area using like these wooden planks instead of the balance beam, which was also a wooden plank of about the same type of size and material. And I got to the end and I crossed the finish line and I looked back at him like, wait, I think I did that wrong. So I ran back and I just did it again in case I had just enough time before (laughs) third place came in to be able to do it again and do it correctly. And Carl saw that and he he liked that I took, you know, the initiative to do the obstacle correctly and kind of the, um, the ethics behind the obstacle and integrity, I guess, which is something that I think we always talk about in OCR, but don't always see, unfortunately. And so we just built a relationship after that moment. And, and, um, I really wanted to keep improving on my grip and, um, they're such a great company and great people that it made a lot of sense. And, and it's been a great relationship ever since. And now they're supporting our team as well with, uh, Mudgear Battle Alliance pro team and, and all of the Battle Alliance races, you're always going to see their grip. So awesome, um, company, awesome product, great people. And then they've also been a, a really great sponsor as well. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, definitely check out Force 5. You can head over to their website and pick up some grips. And they come in, the packaging they come in is so nice. Like, oh, I, felt, man. <laughs> I felt guilty throwing it away. I was like, should I keep this? It's I like, kept mine for a while. <laughs> it's like each hold is like individually boxed and packaged. You know, it's not just like, oh, it's just thrown in a box with a bunch of like styrofoam. It's like, I mean, yeah. it's nice. I feel like I'm, I'm buying something very expensive every time it's a cool unboxing experience in general like it it just it felt like i was getting something high quality yeah it was was awesome and yeah i've got i built a rig we just bought a house about a year ago and i built a rig in my backyard and there's always something force five on there um so definitely great training tools so let's talk about your rig in your backyard right so i Mm -hmm. for for my rig I, i just take my my garage and I basically turned it into an entire gym. So we don't put cars in there, just work out. <laughs> and I, I drill, um, like, uh, eyelets, these like heavy duty eyelets, like right into the ceiling, obviously on the support structure yeah. there. So that's how I put up my rate, but yours is a freestanding one. So tell me about, you know, why, or how, how you went with that and, you know, kind of how much, how much that runs or did you build it yourself, et cetera. Yeah, we ended up building it ourselves because they can be pretty expensive. There's a guy down here in South Florida that builds a lot of um, 
wooden obstacles for ninja gyms that are very high quality. And I reached out to him and it was pretty high price, but he does put on some really quality stuff. So I, I could understand the justification for it. Um, and if he's buying all the materials and everything, but I felt like between my dad is super handy and I can carry heavy stuff pretty good, <laughs> um, even though I'm not the biggest OCR athlete. So I figured we could figure this out together. Uh, and then that way I could design it myself and make it exactly how I wanted. I have a pretty cool design for how to be able to interchange the bars on it. So I can change distances. I can change heights. Um, it's 24 feet long. Uh, if you include like the whole structure, I kind of put like some salmon ladder bars on the end so I could have a bar there too and use the full 24 feet of it. Oh, nice. Um, but then I can interchange the bars for different distances if I want to hang things or if I want to have the chaise. It, it's pretty, pretty cool. It takes a little bit of time and I need like a little step ladder or something, but um, I'm proud of the overall design. And then on one side, I've got a long, it's like a long cliffhanger, but I just use it to have extra wood to put in um, like a Pegatron type thing. It's nice. just one lane. It doesn't have like the multiple uh, distances of, of holes for Pegatron. You know, like uh, it's like, you know, there's three, three lanes of holes on Pegatron. Mine is just one across, gotcha. which is good for training though, because then, you know, I have to be much more precise with my placements. I can only aim for one, one hole. Um, and then on the other side, I have some cliffhangers and stuff, um, a wide variety of, of cool things. Um, one, once it's up, like it, it took a little while, but you know, I just got the structure up and then I started adding things like the cliffhangers I just put in recently, for example. So it was just good to have the structure and the poles. And, and then I started slowly building things on and then with great holds from force five and stuff like that, I can always uh, mix it up. Yeah. This, so this is the third house I've lived in where I've had to put up my rig. So I've, <laughs> my, my second one was probably the best. Cause I was like, you know, I was really focused and I was like, all right, I put the pegboard there. I'm putting the rotating monkey bars here and the um, um, I have this thing from Synergy Sports. It's called the Climber, and it's essentially mm -hmm. it's a center point pivot, and then it's got like a bar sticking out, and then a monkey bar on each end, so you can okay. do like you know practice you know either all, you know angled pull ups, so like one hand's higher than the other, or you can do you know you can traverse from bar to bar, which is actually really hard because the, okay. the gap is really far. Um, nice. So I had that up in my last two houses. I haven't put it up in this one, and. Uh, I had my, you know, my pegboard up in my last house. I haven't put it up in this one. I had the traverse wall up in my last house. I haven't put it up in this one yet. So we'll see. Yeah, the, the good thing about mine right now, is, again, I live in South Florida, so it can get really hot. Um, our neighbors have this like, humongous tree. I don't even know what kind of tree it is, but it has this huge, like, shady area that goes into our yard. And so I was able to put in a spot that is nice and shaded um to keep me like from not overheating or my hands burning on the metal bars and stuff when it gets really hot over here but i can also still have kind of some of that outdoor ocr type training when it gets wet or it's really humid and stuff like that it's kind of what i like about it and then i set up kind of different distance loops in the neighborhood so i can then you know incorporate the rig and other things i have in my backyard to kind of like a, a race simulation type training nice yeah some great specific training I'll yep. also also recommend some of that stuff in my book, the new yep, guide exactly. to elite obstacle course racing, which has an interview with Jay in the back. So yeah, definitely great want to stuff. Check I just out. got mine. Thanks for sharing it. I got mine at um, the last uh, Battle Alliance event. So I've been reading up on what some of the other athletes had to share too. Yeah, and we changed out. I changed out the majority of the athletes in the back of the book. The only ones I kept the same were Hobie Call, um, just because he's kind of out of the sport now. And Lindsay Webster, just because she said she didn't have that much to add. But what I think is really cool about her interview is it was from 2015. So it's before she like won multiple, I don't know how many world championships mm. she's won at this point. It's a lot. Yeah. Her right? resume is insane since then. <laughs> yeah. So, so I think it's really cool because you can see what she was, what her mindset and training was like, you know, back in 2015 as she was kind of uh, skyrocketing towards the top there, but before she actually reached it. So. It's yeah, crazy. It's we're 2021 now, right? It's been a, it's crazy how long we've been in the sport. It still feels like a very young sport, but yeah, for our individual careers, it's a decent amount of time. Yeah, and then if you look at you know the the sport, I would say really started in mm, I would say 2011, right? So the first year mm -hmm. Spartan held the world championships, and the first year World Toughest Mudder held the world championships. Um, you know, and I, I don't know I I've been racing 
my first world's toughest was 2014 and my first OCR was 2013. So okay. it's, um, it's pretty early in the sport. And if you, if you want to go from the start of OCR world championships, you know, that, that first year was 2014. So it's been, yeah, that's a good percentage of the life of lifetime of the sport at this point. Exactly. How do you feel? I'm going to ask you a question. How do you feel it's evolved? Cause I, I look at Ninja in the same amount of time and it's insane how the courses have changed. Yeah. I don't know if OCR should evolve at the same rate, but I do feel like there's, I don't know if it's certain race series or, or what to blame it on, but I feel like it hasn't evolved at the same rate. And maybe it's because one has a TV show and the other one is focused more on, you know, the, the community, but the Ninja community has also grown really quickly too. Yeah. I, I would say the Ninja community definitely has grown faster. And I think, like you said, a lot of that's driving from the TV show. So if the TV show keeps putting on harder obstacles, the community mm -hmm. has to adapt, right? Because everyone wants to go on the show and everyone wants to do well. And then on top of that, you know, N Ninja, you can reset all the obstacles and you only have to put one person through at a time. So you can spend the, more money on a single obstacle and make it, you know, kind of more epic versus yeah. OCR. You know, we still get, I would say 90% of our revenue as a, as an industry from the open wave athlete um, who, you know, uh, you, you, you go to an average race and you watch the open wave athlete and like a lot of them can't do the rope climb. Right. Like, yeah. And that's not like no one, I don't think anyone listens to this podcast. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I would assume everyone listening to the podcast can do a rope climb, you know, fairly easily or uh, maybe not fairly easily, but they can do it. You know, they understand. Funny, I remember easy. my first, it was my second OCR ever. So my first one was a warrior dash 2013, I think as well, similar to your start year. Um, the second one I did was, it was called brave soldier challenge. It was at university of South Florida. I think it was more of like a ROTC type event than it was really a, an OCR, but there is some very OCR type feels to it. Um, and there's a rope climb with, and it, it had knots. If it wasn't for the knots, I probably would have had a little bit of trouble. I would have been able to do it, but I would have struggled. <laughs> and now it's like, you know, I do legless rope climbs in my backyard, like all the time as part of my normal training while running. So it's, it's crazy. We have evolved a decent amount as, as individuals, but I think the sport still has a, a good amount of space to grow. Yeah. And it, it, I think it has. I think most of the people who are training fairly seriously are evolving faster than the sport is evolving. Right. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you take, if we took 20, uh, 21's OCR world championships and replaced it with 20, uh, 14's, the failure rate would have been absolutely ridiculous. Right. Like oh, yeah. the, the platinum rig was in 2014 was absolutely nothing spectacular. It was just like a normal platinum rig. Like I can go back yeah. and look at videos from 2014 and um that decimated the field right like mm -hmm. i mean people couldn't get across and it it was just like rings and monkey bars and some uh, rope and some fatter monkey bars you know and yeah. if you put that on the course today no one would even talk about it it'd be like oh yeah there was a rig somewhere on there i don't remember what was on it as much like, <laughs> like a holds i don't know um and you know going in you know early days of conquer the gauntlet i remember even i, I had a couple of bad races where you know i remember getting stuck in little rock at a uh at the rig and then i still i think i made it across on the third or fourth attempt and because it was yeah. early in the race it was you know it was covered in morning dew and I, I made it across the rig and then caught people and finished third at little rock you know in this past a couple weeks ago at little rock uh battle of the lions i mean those obstacles were definitely harder and uh i ran completely smooth and i think i finished seventh so it was um yeah I mean, yeah, I remember when I used to be able to come up and like know where a rig was in a race and, and know that I could make up some ground there. Now it's like, man, I gotta, you know, I can't rely on that. No, you so can't. There's a, a decent, especially those athletes that are going to an event like Battle of the Lions Elite. Um, there's a, a community of us that are, you know, high enough level now that um, you can't just rely on people who get stuck there anymore. Like you could someone that maybe came to a conquer the gauntlet, but was mainly racing Spartan and was fast, but what, you know, you knew they were going to get stuck at Pegatron or at Tarzan right. swing or something like that. It's, it's harder to rely on that now, which I think is good for, for us, but it is also much tough, tougher competition overall. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So we, 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 we wildly, uh, got off topic there. Um, but it, I hope, you know, I think that was, that was some good information for some of our listeners, especially for those looking to build up their own training in their own backyard. So some of the stuff we want to talk about this episode are, you know, battle of the lions, the conquer the gauntlet to mud gear battle of the lions name change, 
Uh, I'll mention Master of the Rig, and then we'll kind of talk about things that we got going on into 2021 and 2022. And I know this podcast is slightly late because I've been busy because what we're, we're recording this at the end of my peak week for World Toughest Mudder. So I literally spent the, like almost all of my waking hours in the last week uh, training. So that is why Just I did more miles than I get all year. Yeah, I did it. So I, I did a hundred <laughs> I did 101 miles this week. Um, wow. you know, not all of it was, there was some, some, I was working on some of my walking too, uh, because okay. you, need that, you need that skill. So I, I spent uh, some de- a decent amount of time on the treadmill, you know, walking, which is actually worse because it, it takes more time. Right. So instead of doing, you know, nine minute miles, I'm doing 14 minute miles, mm-hmm. which just eats up more of the day, which is a little bit frustrating. And then, uh, I bonked pretty hard. Uh, yesterday I did a eight mile in the morning and I went pumpkin picking with the kids and my wife. And then I went, I did another 16 miles and just like, I crashed so hard. It, it was, it was a messy, uh, final four miles back to the house. Let's just say that. Oh, so, and today I've been sleeping, you know, a good chunk of the day, but yeah, let, let's start yeah, off. Nice. Let's start off with the, uh, name change, right? So yeah. you know, if, if you haven't seen the video, go back to go to the mud gear battle Alliance page or go to our website, uh, BOTL pro team.com, or you can go to CTG pro team. They both, redirect you to the same site and there's a video on there uh film shot and edited by bobby ross that shows the changeover announcement but kind of for those of you who haven't seen the video and are too lazy to go click on it I, one i encourage you to do that but two you know it's basically end of 2020 um you know talking to the conquer the gauntlet owners they're like you know we don't we don't think we need a pro team anymore especially with only us only doing one race in the year they're like you can leave now or you can uh stick around for another year you know it's up to you and it was, it was a really a no brainer decision. You know, we've, we've been with conquer the gauntlet for at that point, five years. And it was like, I'm not going to kind of abandon ship, you know, just cause you're down to one race for a year. So it, it, it was no brainer decision. We stayed with conquer the gauntlet for one more year. And, you know, this was December, 2020 when this conversation was going on. So we had no idea kind of what the future holds and we're like, all right, well, you know, we'll figure it out in, in 12 months. <laughs> <laughs> And then uh, unbeknownst to us, there was Battle of the Lions uh, being developed in the background and fast forward a couple months and um, yeah, decided to switch over to them. And then from, uh, I'd been, we've been shooting some of those commercials for Mud Gear, the Made Tougher commercials. And, you know, from talking to Mud Gear, uh, thought that would be a great partnership too. So we kind of did the uh, co-sponsor lead, uh, which again, I stole from Cycling World, which often has two two. Sp- you know, title sponsors for their teams. And, uh, you know, a lot of my, a lot of the, the model we're using for the pro team, again, we stole from the, I stole from the cycling world, right? Like, you know, they, they name the Jersey and, and then, uh, you have supporting sponsors at other parts of the Jersey. And then, um, if your title sponsor leaves, like conquer the gauntlet, you find a new title sponsor and you keep the team team together. So that's what we did. Yeah. yeah I'm yeah. glad we were able to pull that off. Cause I, I feel like we had such a good system, great sponsors, great products that, you know, we're able to benefit from because of those relationships. Um, so it was good to see that we could still keep that model going. And then when those ended up being the two, like that, that was such an awesome bonus. I mean, obviously I missed the fact, you know, I missed the number of Conquer Gauntlet events that they had and I'm still going to try to go as many of the, the one events each, you know, that they have um for the years to come because it's one of my favorite races yeah same but then seeing what was coming from battle alliance um in terms of like obstacle difficulty and course difficulty overall um as well as obviously mandatory obstacle completion and, and what they're trying to build there was was exciting and then mud gear i got my first pair of mud gear uh products at the um, battle frog series um, league championship that we filmed for ESPN. Mm-hmm. That was like one of the, the gifts or like products for the athletes to use while on set. And I've used them ever since, you know, a different pair of socks, obviously than the one that I bought and then I got that day, but I've had some general mud gear ones. I've got some conquer the gauntlet branded ones. Um, and they, they've been absolutely wonderful. So to, to have that, um, sponsor lineup as well was just like icing on the cake so two great brands that i've been um excited to, to work with now we're even closer to so that's great yeah so mud gear take my my relationship with mud gear way back they sponsored ocr america one back in 2016 
they were one of the, okay. the the sponsors on the back of the shirt there. So I've been I've had a touch, and at the time, I remember when I when I reached out to them, I was only vaguely familiar with the product, um, mm-hmm. and now it's like I mean. My wardrobe is like all all mud gear. <laughs> like I, I can make you can it wear the a week. full mud gear suit. Yeah, and then I can make it through the week without um, you know, having to do laundry on my socks. At least I'm not yeah. not quite there for the shirts, but I've got a I've got a decent number of shirts at this point. So I've got the the long socks, the short the short socks. I'm sorry, I don't remember what they call them. I think like the the different um, the, names so, for them. But yeah, there's the no show, the quarter yep. crew, um. And the t- compression, I skipped one. Oh no, okay, yeah, no show, quarter crew, rucksack compression. Those are the four. Because okay. I just so wrote an article the- about choosing the length <laughs> of socks. That's how I know all of them by name. Yeah, so I've got the quarter crew and then the the full length one. Um, I also use their shorts for training. I, I really like their shorts, and then their shirts, like they're really comfortable, but also like durable. So I wear them for a wide variety of things, just for training, obviously, but also just for like being around or. When we're going on trips and stuff. I, I wore my mud gear a lot on our last road trip that we did and to Grand Canyon and stuff. So it's great, great products. Yeah, I'm wearing the mud gear made tougher lifestyle tee right now and it's super soft. Highly, highly recommend them. So yeah, so we uh switch names there and um continuing continuing on. And uh, yeah, we'll be uh we'll be at Battle of Wines and like Jay said, we'll be at Concord Gauntlet, and then you'll find us at whole bunch of other races, you know, as usual. Um, so pretty, pretty much business as usual for the team. And we're still producing content, still producing technique videos and workout Wednesday videos. And uh, kind of, you can track the team on, on our Facebook page there and catch updates from our website. So, and a lot of the, uh, you know, the, a lot of the conquer the gauntlet stuff on our website will keep, right. So the, a lot of the historic results and the techniques for the uh, conquer the gauntlet specific obstacles we're going to keep on there because that's still great information. And, um, you know, we're not like, you know, we still have a great relationship with conquer the gauntlet. We still love Steve and Courtney. Right. So. Uh, for yeah. sure. I mean, most of us were, were there at this last event. It was an awesome event. Yeah. Um, super stack field. I had to like kill myself to get fifth. Um, it was a great, great race. Yeah, so they at the last event was for those who are not tracking, that was the last continuum event, which I wasn't tracking going into it. Uh, but when I went to sign up for 2022, uh, there was no continuum option, and I was like, "Oh, is this? Are we adding this later? Like the team race?" Um, so the team race is supposed to come back for 2022. Uh, continuum is not supposed to come back, so that was the final continuum. And uh, I people were like, "Oh, you must be really upset." And it's like, "Yeah, you know, it's pretty painful." Like. <laughs> like I enjoy winning and I enjoy kind of racing, but like, you know, there's some, some days I show up to continue and I'm like, man, you know, one lap would be really nice right now. Um, <laughs> and that, that last continuum was a good way to go out. Cause I, it was so hot. It was yeah. terrible. And it's like um, 90 something degrees. So I can't remember if I told this on the podcast already, but so I'm going to tell it again real quick. So Bobby Ross, the filmmaker, you know, who shot the mud gear commercials and all the other, a lot of the other footage was put out. Uh, he sees me come through on one of the laps and he's like, Hey, Evan, I'll, I'll, I'll help pace you for the last lap. And I'm like, cool, Bobby. Sounds good. Cause I don't feel very well. And, um, you know, I come around for that last lap and Bobby's been running around with his camera and his, all his equipment all day and hasn't been fueling like I've been fueling and I've been fueling, <laughs> but I still feel terrible. So Bobby starts jogging with me and I'm not moving very fast. It's like a walk jog. And, uh, we made it to the first aid station, which is about a mile and a half into the course. And Bobby sits down for a drink of water and I turn around and he is gone. He, he did not get back up. So he made it about a mile and a half. And then like, he was like, yeah, I was, I was going to black out. I was not feeling good. It's just passed out so, there under the water table. So I, I lost my pacer there on that last lap. Um, but yeah, pretty funny story. All right. Let's, uh, you know, Talk a little bit more about Battle of the Lions. So we just we did their final event in Little Rock. Now, uh, what were your thoughts on the Little Rock event and kind of how it compares to Battle of the Lions series as as a whole? Yes, yeah, so I, I did the first and the last. I was able to make it to the grip course uh, back in was that May or June, and then um, I wasn't able to make it to the events in between, and got to go here to the standard course, which was the kind of the good mix. And that's what I loved about this last the standard is that there was such a good mix of carries, of grip obstacles, 
of sections where it was just a solid run. Like you had to be truly well-rounded in order to do well. Um, I got exposed for, for a, definitely a weakness with the brute force bag that they had there that was um, super heavy and uh, I got, I got beat up there, but it was still like a super enjoyable course because you were getting like, attacked from all different angles when it comes to like your skill sets. And when I think of some of the best races I've done overall, those are always the ones where you feel most accomplished is when like, you feel like everything's been kind of um, worked. And when I, when I went off to explore um, the warrior race in South Africa a few years back, that's because I wanted to, to have one of the biggest challenges and I went there expecting, you know, the biggest grip challenge because they're so well known for their insane rigs and crazy grip um, obstacles. But I didn't realize how heavy their carries were and how much their carries were designed to tax your grip as well. So not only are they giving you a hard grip course, they're giving you hard carries that then tax your grip for other things too. And so this event, um, the Battle Alliance standard was just like taking you and beating you up in different ways that makes everything else a little bit more challenging. And, and it was just like a, such a cool experience there having some of the coolest grip obstacles you've seen, some of the most unique carries and challenging carries. Um, and then kind of putting that all together with a section that had like a pretty long run um, that nobody could have like an individual advantage at any overall on the course but you had like your certain points where you could kind of dial in if you're a grip person or a runner or uh, a heavy carry guy so that was awesome the grip course was similar in in dallas in that um it was one of the best grip courses i've been to in a long time we also had a little bit of help from some uh kind of dewy weather i guess i don't think it rained that day specifically but it was kind of wet out there so yeah um i was just coming off an of injury so i was not running very hard at all but i was able to make my way up until seventh, I think, just because of the grip obstacles at the end that were starting to put some people um, down because they were, they were really good ones and they were kind of one after another. So that was pretty awesome too. Great, great series overall. And, and one of the most challenging ones out there right now, at least in the U S. Yeah. So I, I was at all four and to me, the, the standard course, the one in little rock had actually had felt like it had more grip than the grip course in Dallas. Do, do you, I think you're right. Awesome? If, so if, it depends though, because it like Maybe as a if, grip specialist, if, like, if the Dallas was, course would have been dry, the Dallas yeah. course would have been significantly easier. Um, yeah, like I, I fell off portion. two things. Yeah, I fell off two things at in Dallas because things were wet. Uh, mm -hmm. But if it was dry, I would have I would have breezed through Dallas. That's a good point because I think, for example, like Stairway 2.0 for some of the guys that got stuck there probably normally would have been able to get it, um, but because it was wet they, you know, slipped off a couple of times. That's, that's a good point. Um, but also like the overall, I think, I think your assessment is correct, but I think the other thing about Dallas was that there was a good amount of them back to back kind of towards the end of the mm, course. True. So it kind of like taxed your, your forearms really bad at that point. And some of the carries there too were grip focused as well. We started off with a cinder block carry that you held the cinder blocks from like these little PVC pipes so it's a little wider grip than you're normally used to. And that was, you know, like right off the bat, trying to weaken your grip a little. And then there was another farmer carry later on. It was all kind of meant at beating up your forearms. So that was um, why I think that one still could have been up there. But I think you're right overall that the, the weather had more of a factor on it overall than the specific course. Yes. For those that weren't in Little Rock, let's see, there was, uh, there was a version of Skull Valley there. There was a version of Legaff there. There was a version of a Force 5 low rig uh, that was, you know, had a fairly complex series of holes. They had a version of Canyon, so the down up uh, rig, uh, again, with a Force 5 series of holes that included things like, you know, nunchucks and uh, short ropes and, uh, you know, bombs there. They had a Dragon's Back, a version of Dragon's Back was there with a couple of jumps. They had uh, a couple of heavy carries there and, uh, you know, the, the sandbag carry, you had to go around a hexagon repeatedly um and then like through low crawls repeatedly so that was kind of a unique twist uh twist on life was there so a lot of great obstacles it was you know what people don't realize is that weekend so we're you know we're seven days out from the event and uh dave main prize and sydney morris the uh owners of battle of lines are still in ocr world championships just in vermont taking down the course 
So you're seven days away. You know, normally, normally a lot of race companies like to get there like two weeks in advance to kind of lay things out and figure things yeah. out. So they're seven days out and they're still not there. On Tuesday, so I, I was I was talking to David behind the scenes. On Tuesday, they're like, "All right, we're heading to the venue." On Tuesday, so at this point, you're like <laughs> 96 hours out from the event, and they're like, like you know, they weren't even sure they could they could physically get the obstacles up in time. That's the crazy part. And there was yeah, I don't think they slept. There was there was they were like, should, they're like, should we cancel it? Should we cancel it and push it back a couple of weeks? And I was like, no, definitely don't do that. That's a bad idea. Um, but the 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 amount of work and effort those guys put in in that shortest period of time was ridiculous. Like that's what was the most impressive thing about the event was the complexity of those obstacles in such a short time. Uh, really speaks to the volume and effort that those guys put in because it was, I mean, ninety six hours. If you would have gone to the venue, it just would have been a field. Yeah. And, and they don't have the same volunteer base as some of the more, you know, races that have been out for a long time. Obviously they have some like very dedicated support volunteers, but not the numbers that you would see helping build some of these other courses. And if you look at it, you know, if you go to a battle Alliance event, um, on the like flashy side of things, it's not going to be like some of these other races you might be at, but when it comes to like the obstacles themselves, when it comes to the course itself, it's on par or better than any race that I've been to. And for them to be able to pull that off in that short of a period of time is, is absolutely incredible. So I'm excited to see. And, and part of, I think your answer to earlier, the question about which grip was more challenging is as they've built this season, um, you know, cool things have happened, right? They've had some cool obstacles. They've made adjustments to obstacles. They've adapted some and like converged some, I guess you'd say. Mm-hmm. And that's going to, I think, continue to build on their creativity and what they're able to bring to these events in the future. So I'm, I'm really excited to see what they'll, they'll put together for this, um, for this next season of four races. Yeah, if, if you're going to obstacle course races for the obstacles, which I think everyone is, <laughs> then you need to come to Battle of the Lines. I mean, they, their, their obstacles are phenomenal. It's, it's OCR World Championship quality obstacles um, with, you know, without such as – Obviously, there's a lot more people at OCR Championships, and it's a lot more more of a, a like a big event. But um, you know, the obstacles are it's the same build crew, right? So yeah. you're getting the same so obstacles. <laughs> feel free to plead, plead the fifth if you if you need to. But what was harder? You went to both events this year. I wasn't able to go to Worlds. What was more challenging, obstacle no, it's not a, wise? It's not even a question. It's Battle of the Lines. All all four, each of the four Battle of the Lines was harder than OCR World Championships obstacles. Okay. I'll, I'll say that. That's so. I think yeah. that's your answer again. If you're going to OCR for the obstacles, this is one of the best series out there. Um, and, and I love OCR World Championships, so I'm not saying anything Me too. negative yeah. against them. But um, it's just a whole other level. And so, if you want to be prepared for Worlds, if you want to go to Worlds and have like no fear of losing your belt or your sorry your band, go to go to Battle Alliance and, and beat yourself up a couple of times first, and then. Absolutely. You know, that's going to help you know what you need in order to be ready for Worlds. And that's what, you know, I'm hoping that I can get to all four next year. We'll see what my schedule looks like. But, um, you know, normally I wouldn't look forward to that strength course. I weigh 130 pounds, right? But I want to go because I want to know what I need to work on for other events and for the future of OCR, right? And so I'm, I'm looking forward to, and I like the model that they have, like the strength course, the grip course the endurance course and then the standard you know the last event that kind of puts it all together in a very well-rounded ocr event yeah and i know like ocr world championships is not typically a uh cheap endeavor right i mean the, yeah. the race there's a, it's a premium race so you're getting premium prices for entry but then on top of that if you want to stay like at or near the resort you know the, the hotel rooms are pretty pricey and then uh there's not a whole lot of food there so the you know you're paying a lot for food so you know it's it's a pretty big investment. So I would, I would I would seriously consider coming to Battle of Lions to get some reps on some of these obstacles and some of these kind of like Jay said to kind of expose your weakness um, at an event that you know may not be your A race, it may be your B or C race, and then that way when you go to OCR World Championships, you're you're ready to go. Yes, so th- th- that'll handle the grip portion, and then you just need to uh, find a mountain course. So you can, <laughs> exactly, you can go to one of your any like any Spartan and find a. Uh, find that training and run up the mountain a couple times and um, you'll be, you'll be ready to go on the grip side and then on the mountain side. 
and you might even get some sneak peeks again, like you're saying, it's the same build crew. Um, trying to think of, yeah, like some of that stuff that we saw earlier in the year ended up being at Worlds for the first time. Yeah, Twist on Life was one of them. And I mean, Canyon, we had a version of Canyon at the uh, Oklahoma City event. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, well, we weren't calling it Canyon then, but it was, uh, that was the uh, endurance course. So we did that three times. So it was, it was a rope climb and then to a, you know, essentially downward Valkyrie and upward Valkyrie. So that technique video is on our uh, Facebook page if anyone wants to go check it out. And so it was the uh, newer technique video, the one that Jay shot with the Force 5 holds that are a little more complex. Yeah, that was such an awesome obstacle. Um, yeah. I, I hope they can continue to expand on that, especially with the Force 5 grips. Uh, since there wasn't bells at this last one, you know, you kind of touched the last hold. Uh, it would have been cooler to see what would have happened if people had to use the, the full um, the full canyon, I guess. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I still used, I mean, the, the last hold wasn't, what was it, the last hold of rope? It wasn't too bad. Yeah. yeah okay, yeah. So. But I'm saying, like, you basically, you could have gone two holds below it and just tapped the rope. And ah, that's, you know, I that's see, like tapping a bell. Whereas you had to climb one or two more pulls, or if you have to go then from that last rope to another hold, I don't think it would have changed a ton for everyone. Um, but it, it could mix it up a little. If, it's if true. Each one of those obstacles, now you have an extra move or two that you have to do that can, that can make a difference. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so speaking of obstacles and obstacle proficiency, did you catch any of the 100-meter OCR World Championships? I don't want to go into it too depth because we talked yeah. about it with uh, Jarrett Newby uh, two episodes ago. But you, you saw yeah, that, I'm right? super excited for that event until I saw what happened this yeah. year. <laughs> um, yeah, not going like to dive into it, it, but basically people could jump. You know, a lot of the male athletes were fit enough where they could jump from the start line and then hit, tap the bell without touching the obstacle, uh, which was, was like, eh, not really what I was hoping for. But, you know, pr- prior to the 100 meter, um, you know, well, let's go, go back in time to 2017. Yeah. Tell us about what Master of the Rig was. Yeah, Master Rig was awesome. So basically, it was it was a rig competition. Um, there was different stages of elimination. Like early on, there were like these large waves of people, and like the first couple of people to complete the rig would make it through the to the you know next round. I think it started out as like a, a double elimination early on, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then once there was a smaller field, then they had some more like smaller groups and some head to heads. In the end, it ended up being like a, a final four that took off on two separate rigs. So you got to play on like a whole bunch of different style of rigs. They used the battle frog one, they had a platinum rig that they set up and then they had some unique lanes that were a little bit more challenging than what you normally see in OCR for like the finals area. There's like a pegboard included in a portion of one and um, some really tricky holds, but um, it was, it was a combination then of endurance and speed because you had to get through them quickly, but, also throughout the night, you're going multiple rounds at, at these um, very challenging rigs. So you had to be able to have the grip endurance to keep going. Um, so that's what I noticed early on. You had to be really quick uh, in order to make it through. But then towards the end, there were some quick guys that were making mistakes because of either they were, they were gassed out or it was just the pace was getting a little, a little more challenging. Um, and it was cool that year. It was kind of late at night. It was a little bit rainy too, actually. So that made it even more challenging. Uh, but it really did test your obstacle efficiency, your obstacle endurance, your obstacle proficiency overall uh, versus what I think we saw this year. And, and that I think was an unintended con- consequence of just the setup. Um, I don't think that's what OCR World Championship wanted. And I think athletes just kind of took advantage of that. So I, I would love for something to come back similar to the master of the rig where you're taking on some of the most challenging course obstacles that we've seen on these courses and, and seeing who can take it to the next level. Yeah. I think the, the way they have the hundred meter set up now, obviously let's fix the bell placement or, you know, make it double base. So you have to essentially hang on part of the obstacle to make it across. Um, but I'm okay with even adding like all right, we have the 100 meter OCR. Now let's do the 20 meter OCR, right? Like, you know, which essentially is the length of the rig or however however long a rig is. I don't know off the top of my yeah. head. 
Um, so it, I would love to see, and maybe it's not a hundred meters because that is, I don't think a lot of people could complete a rig that long unless if there's maybe some, some rest points, but I'd love to see a really long, one, like a pretty crazy endurance yeah. rig. Maybe throw some laches in there to get some extra distance too. Um, or you, you, you could do it. You could do a really long rig with rest points and you know, the, the top guys will probably not rest. Um, yeah. And then the, it. you know, the average person who's doing it just wants to see how well they can do and how far they can go um, can rest after every bay. Right. And you stand on the, on the little bar. The, the, the winner's yeah. not going to rest. Right. Or, or if he does rest, it's going to be like a very brief, like step and jump off or something. Exactly. Right. Quick, quick, shake your hands out and hop back on the next one right. type of thing. Um, yeah. Something like that would be incredible. I don't know about the logistics or the cost of something like that, right. but it would and be you need space too. Really cool to see. Yeah. You need space too. So the, you know, the yeah. year the year you did it, the rig was right at the bottom of the mountain. And I believe yeah. the I believe Platinum Rig was the one who put everything on, right? It wasn't the OCRWC uh Yeah, Platinum Rig was. organized and, and designed it and anyone anyone that qualified for worlds could compete. Um it would they yeah, they had the rig right at the bottom. There's two rigs. So we ended up using two separate sets of rigs. And then like I said, the different lanes, because there's so many lanes at world, they were able to, worlds they were able to adjust it um so it's really tricky with what they're trying to do overall uh but if if this is a distance that they really want to to like go all in on as a future portion of the sport i think you're going to need something more than just those jumps and a a long rig like that could throw in something really cool because there could be people you know some of the top athletes are going to have a lot of uh, speed with it too, but then there's like a lot of things that can happen along the way. And if you can just follow, I can imagine kind of the audience following along the edge of the rig, it would be really cool to watch Uh, a lot of kind of things going on and, and very spectator friendly versus some of the other challenges we face like that in the sport. Maybe we can convince Carl to do a force five master of the rig, uh, championship at, at the next OCRWC. That would be the dream. <laughs> <laughs> start uh start messaging Force Five and leaving those comments like, yeah. hey, uh, do master the rig again. Or I think we're gonna have to put it in the suggestion box, right? <laughs> yeah. And the I believe OCRWC is uh actually survey just closed. I think it was yesterday actually. So oh, not very not very <laughs> useful um giving you a day late, but you can always message them or post about it in the a Facebook group there. I know obviously Adrian and Rachel and the staff of OCRWC read those messages. So they'll see it. And obviously Dave yeah. and Sydney, um, not confirmed they're going to be on the build crew next year, but uh, will likely be, be on the build crew because Dave and Sydney have both been on the build crew for several years at this point. So I, th- I think the other cool thing that could happen there, and you're starting to see this in Ninja as well, both on TV and in the National Ninja League is uh, skills competition. So you know, individual things like a rig or like a short circuit of carries of different varieties. Like, you know, who's the, who's the rig master? Who's the, the heavyweight champ, I guess, when it comes to the, to the carries. Um, I don't know what other types of skill sets you could throw in there for OCR, maybe like a, a mountain climb, like who gets to the top of the mountain, king of the hill type of thing, who gets up there the fastest. I think there would be a lot of really cool um, things that OCR worlds could, incorporate in there that doesn't have to be as all encompassing, but as little is more, more focused. And then you can do it with a couple of obstacles versus having to, to use it all, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, they have something like that now with the primes. So it's, it's in, in course uh, section that they time you on. So they, they, they tested uh, ascending, descending, and then uh rec bag carry with the three this year. Okay. And then you could, you could actually look in your results and sh- it would show you where you, ranked from those three specific sections in addition to where you're ranked overall for the, for the entire course. So that's cool. I think we're, on, I think we're on our way. I think we're getting there. Um, obviously like battle of the lines, like OCWC, you got to show up and you got to, you know, you vote with your money at the end of the day. Right. So you got to show exactly. up and you got to support these brands. And if you want more stuff, you, you let them know and you sign up for the stuff that they do have. So it sends a signal that you want more. So it's another good reason to go to a, a battle alliance if they are going to be building again you know let's support this event let them get really creative with their own race series and then they can bring you know that towards worlds to what they bring in worlds you know absolutely absolutely 
All right, what do you got left in 2021 and moving into 2022? So I've got a uh, Savage Race uh, coming up in November in, in Florida. Um, probably only the Blitz. I've got a conference I have to be at before that. Good news is the conference is close to the race. Bad news is I probably have to be doing conference stuff on Saturday. Um, the other good news about it is the Florida race is the one that does have the competitive blitz. So I'm excited for that and see who's going to show up to, to try to take that one on. Um, that'll probably be my last OCR for this season. Uh, hopefully I can squeeze in maybe like one more ninja competition uh, sometime before the end of the year. And then uh, I will early on next year, some, some ninja competitions early in the, in the season, January, February. Um, and then hopefully a lot of Savage Race, a lot of Battle of the Lions. I really need to get back to Worlds. <laughs> I miss it so much. So my last one was, was 2018. Oh, wow. It was 2019. I was on the Dominican Republic for the Telemundo TV show. 2020, obviously, pandemic. And then this year I had a, a work conflict with my new business, so I wasn't able to make it. So, I mean, I, it's one of my favorite events every single year. So I, I really want to be back there. Um, been doing a lot of training for, for the short course, uh, hoping I could go this year, but it didn't work out. So hopefully next year that'll, that'll pay off. And uh, plug your new business while we're, at, while we're on here. Yeah, so um, I have always focused for like the last uh, five years or so with, an, with the corporation I was working with on STEM education, so science, technology, engineering, and math, focused on, on youth. Um, and now I'm doing it off on my own, um, business is called invent the change. So a play on the words, be the change you want to see in the world, but with a kind of focus on technology and how kids can impact, um, the world doing that. Got a lot of really cool resources on, on my YouTube channel, which is, if you just look up my name, Jay Flores, you can find, um, and, uh, a lot of really cool partnerships coming up. So I've got one now with uh, Discovery Education. I'm part of their mystery science team. So we answer questions that kids submit. My last two were um, how were Lego invented and why don't we fall out of roller coasters when we go upside down? So lots of really fun and good content for your kids. So uh, if you could support with a follow on YouTube or Instagram, if not, at least have your kids uh, <laughs> follow me because I know a lot of parents are out there complaining that their kids are spending too much time on YouTube. You know, if they're following the right accounts, it can be a good use of their time. So uh, appreciate the support there too. Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head, right? I think my daughter has learned a lot from watching like her tablet and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. YouTube, you can really quickly get into like just – hot garbage right like I mean, exactly and then you can really quick get, get into like child inappropriate uh content and not like really bad stuff you know i mean you could but um just stuff where you're like what are you watching don't watch yeah, you're not hoping they're saying those things or doing those repeating those activities type of thing yeah yeah, yeah. but yeah, i think it's just like any platform even like tiktok now is a big one that's popular right you can go in there and you can find some really trash stuff slash also just complete time suck or if yeah. you're following the right accounts, if you're using whatever social media you use properly, you can actually learn a ton, especially YouTube. Um, but I, I, I hate it when people say that, you know, Facebook is trash or filled with all this crap. And well, you choose who you follow on Facebook. Exactly. Who your friends are. Exactly. A, a direct reflection of who you're hanging out with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You got to start there. Yeah, you know, back in 2000, let's see, when I got involved in OCR, I basically um, deleted my social media accounts and I restarted it with all fitness stuff. Okay. So I, I for, you know, for, I, as it's grown, it's, it's uh, you know, I've attracted more, um, more random, random stuff. But, you know, mm -hmm. back in like 2014, 15, 16, like my feed was just fitness information. That was it. Yeah. That's the only people I follow. That's the only people that friend requested me. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like people were a little bit, less political back back then maybe not uh, maybe i just wasn't seeing it i feel it, like it's gotten worse but yeah it it's it probably still was there just not at the same level as it's been recently yeah but yeah so my facebook feed was just a, it was just a like a fitness stream of you know i was following a bunch of fitness magazines and fitness uh websites and then uh the, all the friends i had on there because i had eventually started from zero again i was mm -hmm. they were all fitness people i was like oh cool good good use of my time but for sure. Same yeah. with the kids. Just make sure they're they're following the right accounts and using it the right way because it's a good tool if you use it appropriately. 
Yeah, absolutely. So for me coming up, I got a uh, world's toughest mutter in a couple of weeks. So I will see a bunch of you there. Uh, make sure you order your bleg mitts ahead of time, right? Because I, I will be bringing some bleg mitts there to sell. Uh, the thing is, though, the first thing that I leave at home is random bleg mitts that I may or may not sell. So, you know, like I got to pack my own equipment because I'm racing. So uh, make sure you order them ahead of time. The turnaround time is less than a week typically. So I, I send, go to the post office almost every day. The lady at the post office knows who I am. So uh, you order, they'll be in the mail immediately, basically, you know, within 24 hours. And uh, we ran out of large lights, I think. Any day now, so this is the last, we're about to enter the last week of October, uh, the package from Australia will be showing up with the rest of the large lights. So if you're waiting on large lights, uh, they should be here in the next couple of days. If you, uh, any other size or style, we have all those uh, available and they will ship to you immediately. What else we got, Jay? Anything else before we get going? It's really excited for this next season, and I hope race series can keep um, pushing forward. Um, I'm glad to see that none we haven't had very many big races fall off. Like <laughs> I remember in the early years, there would always be this new race, and then it's gone. And I feel like the ones that are around right now are, are here to stay. Um, I hope let's so. make sure Battle Alliance keeps growing and and um, going. You know, being able to expand and grow in the ways that they want. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm just excited to get back into like a full season, man. Like I said, between the show that I was on, the pandemic, <laughs> and then just this kind of crazy year that was kind of half and half, uh, depending on where you live in the country and, and where you can race. Um, full, true, full OCO. Got a big, I've got a big uh, performance coming soon. This year is a little bit but I can't wait for right on good stuff good stuff there and other than that for 2022 obviously I'll be, I'll be putting on more episodes before then but uh you know toughest mutter as usual battle of the lions as usual and um we got infinite hero honor challenge and so the 2022 events are now live you can sign up for those and again um if you want to get to that make sure you sign up now or sign up before the event Again, send the demand signal to keep it going because we had a small turnout at the first one, the first live one for the event. So um, if you want that to still be around, make sure you sign up and uh, come out, and I will see you there. It's, uh, it's a unique experience. If you're not familiar with it, you head back and listen to the No Excuses podcast with Sean Corvell. But essentially, uh, the very abbreviated version is it's like, a, it's like hurricane heat but for Tough Mudder. But that's about as equiv the equivalent of saying that Spartan and Tough Mudder are the same thing, right? So it's – it's themed, it's fun, um, it, it's, it's challenging, but it's not like do a thousand burpees while I stand there and watch you. It's more like, all right, you're going into enemy territory, here's a mission brief, and then you're going to have to move to point X and recover a down satellite, which is not an actual down satellite, uh, but that's what we're calling it. And then you'll have to move and you know, rescue someone from you know, place X, so you'll have to uh, provide resupply for a unit trapped behind enemy lines. So everything's got like a story and a theme to it, and the, the stuff you're resupplying with them is not going to obviously be real bullets, but it, will, it simulates the weight and dimensions of some of that stuff. So that's what kind of makes it unique. So it's fun. It's creative. It involves you uh, working together, and then you get to interact with the Tough Mudder obstacles in a non-conventional way. So, you know, things like being tied together or being blindfolded or being handicapped where you can't touch certain portions of the obstacle or going in reverse or going upside down, you know, whatever. The, the, the obstacles are changed in a way where you'll get to interact with it in a way that you've never thought or uh, experienced before. So even people who've been to Tough Mudder a lot get to experience it in a different manner. It still counts towards your Legionnaire status. So for those of you who are very concerned about upping those numbers, and I know they just rolled out a whole bunch of new headbands. So previously it was like 25, 50, 75, 100. I think there's now every 10 between uh, like 30, 40, 50, and 50, there's a uh, the new headband. So for those of you who are hardcore Tough Mudder people, you still get credit towards those. Uh, if you want to know more about information, you can head over to toughmudder.com. I have three articles on the Infinite Hero Honor Challenge website. Uh, talking about some of the details behind the events. And uh, yeah, please come out and support that. It'll, it'll be a good time. All right, Sounds Jay. pretty awesome. Yeah, it, it, was, it was really fun to, um, I mean, I didn't come up with the idea, uh, but I adjusted it and kind of 
added a lot of that military flavor into it. So I think I think people will enjoy it. Um, and uh, the the you know the first group we had come through was just super. They were super excited and they had they had such a great time. And they really they really made strong friendships there. Again, if they want to hear specifically from someone who's at the event, the um, Obstacle Running Adventures had um, I don't know, was it Carissa Tayo? Uh, he he had one of the uh, participants on. So the Infinite Hero Honor Challenge. And then we're actually running another event, but it's a private one. So you can actually sign up for the Dallas one. Uh, but I'm actually working with uh, Space Force. So That's awesome. I'm super excited because I've never actually I've never actually met anyone from Space Force yet. Um, so I, I actually work in an office with several um, army guys that have uh, called Space Wings, right? Like you get you get wings um, for working on stuff related to space they're not actual astronauts which is the question okay. that always immediately comes up uh but i've worked with several guys that have space wings uh, but i will actually get to work with the space force and again the space force is not all astronauts uh but yeah should be interesting coming up and then related to you stem uh jay so my, my new job over at a uh, first infantry division if anyone wants to go to their uh, website or rather their Facebook page, First Infantry Division. I have a video on there uh, where they interviewed me and they used some of Bobby Ross's footage, talk about some of my endurance obstacle course racing and resilience, kind of dealing with physical fitness, uh, which also on my Instagram and on my Facebook. Um, so one of my new, one of my new responsibilities over there is I, I do a lot of community engagement. So we actually uh, gave a bunch of fifth graders tours of Apache helicopters, so the uh, attack helicopters, and that's um, awesome. Gray Eagle, so the uh, UAV unmanned aerial vehicle no, platform. So I've been about, a, about twice a month. I go and hang out with fifth graders for an hour, and uh, I don't do most of the talking. I just kind of stand there and kind of escort them. But uh, they get to learn about kind of the military and how STEM involves, you know, is involved with the military, which is you know, it's pretty cool for a fifth grader to see that. And uh, we got to sit in the cockpit of the Apache. So, which uh, I've worked with Apaches numerous times, but that was the first time I actually sat in one because why would a ground guy be in an Apache? Um, I took my, two, <laughs> took my two-year-old son in there so that I got a picture of the two of us inside. It's good stuff. That's cool. We'll have to figure out how we can collaborate on something like that. But also, I don't know if I've shared with you, my dad was a Apache helicopter mechanic. Oh, was he? he? was in, nice. in, the, in the service. So he's got a lot of experience with them, obviously. And um, he, we just went to the air show in Orlando. So he was telling me some stories about when he did get to fly up uh, with test pilots and stuff like that. And they really need to, you know, take, take the equipment to its limits on those tests. So he got to do some really cool things in one. Yeah. Test pilots are crazy. Uh, it's, it's impressive. It's, it's very impressive. You got a lot of, got to have a lot of uh, confidence in your equipment and, uh, yeah. you know, uh, in your skills to, to do that. I just, I finished reading, it was it last year about them testing the SR 71, the, um, or the a 12 ox guard as it was called. So the, you know, plane that flies three times the speed of sound. It's like, and the, the stories they tell from that in that book are literally insane. It's like, Oh yeah, our plane, <laughs> our plane's on the runway. It's leaking fuel. Don't worry. Once we get it up to, to altitude and, and speed, it heats up and the metal expands and it stops leaking fuel. You're like, what? You're gonna fly something that's, that's leaking fine. fuel on it? <laughs> yeah. Material science, man. It's yeah, incredible. I think I think yeah, I gotta I gotta I gotta send you that book link. That's a that's a really good book. Um there's a couple of good books on the development of uh aircraft. Well one of them skunk works. I can't remember what the other one was off the top of my head, but Oh, here it is. Um, digging through my phone as we're talking here. Okay. Yeah, skunk. I, I, skunk works. If anyone's interested in that type of stuff, more of the stem. And what was the other one? I don't know. All right. What do we got? Um, before we get going, you do anything for Halloween, Jay? Since we're recording this shortly before Halloween. Yeah, we were just uh, before the Packer game. Actually, looking for um, costumes. I think I'm gonna be a space billionaire <laughs> so space, we're not, nice you know, we're like a astronaut type onesie but i didn't want to be just an astronaut since we're last minute like it's kind of really hard to figure out what to put together um so i, like, I don't want to be just an astronaut so i was like all right i gotta figure out how to make this like a, a space billionaire now with all the 
the flights going up now and commercial travel to space, hopefully in the future. So I'm going to play off uh, of that theme right now nice. How about yourself. I guess I got a couple, I, I'm Halloween's like my, one of my favorite holidays or my favorite holiday. So I, I mm-hmm. we, we go all in and we, um, you know, within the Midwest, there's trunk or treat. Are you familiar with trunk or treat? I am not. So yeah, I never heard of it until I moved out to the Midwest. Essentially people pull their cars up into a, a parking lot. It's like organized at a church or at a, on the military base and they decorate the back of their cars and they essentially sit in their trunks and they pass out candy. So you kind of, okay. it, it's like, it's like speed trick or treating, right? So you, you yeah. walk around and you hit, you know, 30 different cars in, you know, depending on how crowded it is, it may take an hour, it may take 15 minutes. Um, and you get a, a lot of candy. So we end up, we end up going trick or treating something like three times. We'll go Friday night to <laughs> trunk or treat, Saturday night to trunk or treat, and then we'll actually do Sunday, um, which I take advantage of and have multiple costumes. Clearly, from, so from what I've seen of your kids, they're they're super well behaved. But have you ever seen the I ate all your candy pranks? Oh yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you should try that one of these years. Ah, uh, it's not too cruel. It's too cruel. <laughs> so I'm gonna use. I got a Snake Eyes costume um, that mm-hmm. I wore to Comic Con early this year. So I'm gonna use that for one day. Uh, I think I might reuse a um, Hunk from Resident Evil. He's a, a um, kind of like a SWAT team guy. Um, so it's very okay. similar to my Snake Eyes costume. I essentially changed my mask uh, on day two, and then I have a uh, what is the last one? um knight's templar costume that i'm gonna walk around with on sunday awesome so cool yeah all right um other than that i've been uh binge watching the old halloween movies um in the holiday spirit which are just as terrible as i remember as i <laughs> when i watched them uh 20 years ago so yeah all right uh we're gonna get going jay any final shout outs you want to give friends family sponsors etc yeah, I want to give one to um, to Amy Padgett, actually, one of our, our teammates. Just recently, I mean, I guess I feel like it's probably been a while, but also recently I've re-noticed how good her technique videos are. She's one of the few people I go to for something like a grip technique. Um, she's short, so if you are if you're ever have, like, an excuse at all, oh, I'm too short to do this or, you know, whatever reason why you can't, complete a certain type of obstacle she, she kind of fits that mold it's not like you're someone that's built exactly for this obstacle teaching you how to do it um she's just got some really unique and smart techniques um so shout out to amy and, and our technique videos in general as a team um and then again the the mystery science stuff that i was hinted at earlier so check it out on, on my youtube or just check out mystery science on, on youtube um really fun content for kids and uh, it's been a really cool opportunity because I'm going to be in, you know, m- elementary schools across the country every single month. And just the exposure there, I'm hoping, is going to take me to that Bill Nye-esque type of <laughs> um, impact in the long term with, with kids in, in K-12 science. So really looking forward to that and where awesome. that partnership will go. Awesome. Got some great stuff going on. And then stay tuned. Uh I will, I'm going to do one more ultra OCR fundraiser, uh, linked to folds of honor in 2022. And then I'm going to pivot to some other fundraisers, um, which will also be painful, but it won't be ultra OCR anymore because I'm out of ideas. Uh, but I have one more <laughs> and it's painful. I told Daniel Leonard, uh, one of my friends from strength and speed at OCR championships, what I've been doing. And he was like, that sounds terrible. He's like, this is an awful idea. <laughs> he's, he's like, he's like, I think this is a bad idea. He's like, this might be your worst idea ever, um, which I feel like he said that about every idea. Uh, so, but it's painful. And um, yeah, I just got to line some stuff up. I, I, I'd make the announcement now, but I, I'm not 100% sure at the, because uh, I want to use a specific venue for it. So I'm not, I haven't lined up those ducks in a row yet. But yeah, it should be painful. Whatever it is, I know it is going to be painful and something that no one else would want to do. It's bad and it's, it does not, you know, obviously ultra OCR is my strength, but this is, plays to one of my weaknesses, which okay. I like even less, but uh, I thought of the idea and I don't have any other ideas. So this is what I'm stuck with. So. There you go. All right. We'll, uh, we'll catch you around and uh, definitely go pick up the new strength and speeds guide to elite obstacle course racing. It's on digital and hard copy. Uh, you can buy both of them off Amazon 
or if you prefer and you want a signed copy or something, you can head over to teamstrengthspeed.com and you can buy a hard copy off there. But please check that out. If anyone is listening has Kindle Unlimited, definitely go and check out my books because you can read them for free. And um, even if you don't want to read them, go to the pages and flip through them. Because then I get paid for that. <laughs> so if anyone has any friends or family with Kindle Unlimited, go borrow their Kindle e-reader for a day and uh, flip through some pages for me. I, I'd appreciate it. Or actually read the books, which is probably even better. It's a better use of your time. Um, but that's about it. We will catch all of you um, sometime later, and I will see a bunch of you at World's Toughest. Hopefully, I'll put another podcast before then, now that things are starting to wind down with my training. All right. I'll catch you later, Jay. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, man. Talk to you soon.